Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our wonderful specialist seminars. And today we have the incredible Associate Professor Raj, Dr. Sundaraj, who is just the most lovely person, and we enjoy working with him very much. He is a professor in pain management and has been at the forefront of pain uh, management, pain treatment for many, many years. He's well known in, in that sphere. Today's talk is on chronic persistent pain management, and I hope that you enjoy. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Doctor. If everyone could please keep yourself uh, muted so that um, there's no sound that carries out and interferes with the recording. At the end of the session, there'll be an opportunity to ask your questions, and the recording and slides will be sent to you within about a day of today. Thank you so much, everyone. Over to you, Doctor. Can I do that now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, first, my image is not there. What happened? Oh, there. Hello. Good afternoon to everyone. Can you? I'm sure they can hear me now. Um, well, today's talk is on chronic and persistent pain. Um, and uh, there are a lot of slides, but I'm not going to run through uh, a lot of discussion about the slides. Rather, it'll be there. You can have a look at it as your reference point if you want. Okay. So really, what is the definition of pain? Well, it's unpleasant. It's an emotional uh, uh, a problem. It could be actual. It could be potential. But the important thing is that it's a sensation. Now, in an acute situation, it's for survival. But in a chronic situation, well, it is not for survival. Uh, it's, uh, it becomes a, a, a disease process. Now, I'm going to show you some very four basic personality types. There are these two types. One says, and you'd, have, you'd have come across this, my glass is half full and she seems very positive. And the other guy says, my glass is half empty, it's rather negative. And then you have a third guy who says, half empty, half full. Uh, what was the question? So he's a bit confused. But the fourth guy seems to take the, the cake, so to speak. He has missed the entire point. And uh, uh, this is the type of people we get, you know, who suffer with this type of problem from a very positive, uh, right through to a very negative aspect. I'm going to show... Uh, discuss a, a real pain experience uh, patient who is a real patient of mine mm -hmm. some years ago. That's Michael of middle age. Uh, all he did was lifted a 20 kilogram box and he developed very severe sudden pain. He was actually working in a warehouse and uh, conservative treatment didn't really help. So he was on lots of medications. He, someone said rest, someone says exercise, someone says attend physiotherapy. Are there any problems? Of course, there are problems. You know, he's got a pain, not only in the back and in the leg. So he's had some scans done, and they found that he had a he had a disc prolapse. So he was referred on to a spinal surgeon, and uh, he had to have a limited laminectomy, or in other words, spinal surgery. Unfortunately, post-operative at the hospital, he didn't receive adequate uh, analgesia for his pain. Uh, despite that, he improved. Uh, back pain was manageable. But eight weeks later, his right leg pain became progressively worse. That was the original pain that he had. And his back pain also became worse. He tried to go return to light duties, modified work, but problems became worse. And so he started to get mood swings and he became irritable. And he was still hoping that conservative treatment would cure, went to see his GP, referred to another surgeon, they did an MRI, and they said, there's nothing, nothing serious here that which we could repair. Meanwhile, you know, he was not able to go back to work, poor sleep, taking too many pills. He started becoming very anxious, emotionally became unstable. Family and friends thought that he is uh, putting it on and you know, seeking sympathy. He was obviously worried for his future, his family, his home, the fear of ending up in a wheelchair. And so two years later, he went to see another spinal surgeon who said, yes, you've got this problem, let's do a myelogram since the MRI was normal. And he suggested a fusion surgery because you had an unstable spine, whatever that might mean. Obviously this man, Michael, was desperately agreed for the second surgery. 
And uh, this was done one year later. Now we're looking at about three years down the track from his original uh, work injury. Two months into surgery, he became even worse. His anxiety, the emotional state of mind became worse. He started to take huge amounts of opioids and other medications, uh, continued his physiotherapy, more than likely as all passive physio, not rather than active. He tried various other complementary uh, therapies, including using a tent. None was helpful. He was still hoping for a fix either, like a techno fix. Somebody's going to fix me. Now, three years later, that's about six years down the track, he had a third surgery. He actually became worse. Now, we're looking at about seven years in total from the time of his injury, and he hasn't been to work. At the end of it, uh, the spinal surgical division said, now, listen, we can't do any more. And what did they do? They referred him on to a psychiatrist and he was on tranquilizers and told him, learn to live with it. Now, here's an angry... Oh, I'm sorry, there's some disturbance here. Uh, he, he, he sort of learned to live with it, so to speak. Um, it's at this point he was referred to our, our multidisciplinary paid unit. Was What went wrong? What are the problems? Well, the problems are is a severe pain in his back and lower legs. The primary condition is that, well, he's had a failed back surgery syndrome, a lot of peridural or epidural scarring around the nerve roots, and overall poor quality of life, uh, uh, and his, 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 his living standards were very poor. He has had suicidal thoughts, terminated from his work, taking excessive loads of medications, opioids and benzodiazepines. I mean, he didn't have a university qualification. I mean, he just uh, uh, gained a job in a warehouse uh, from work experience. A very desperate outlook. Uh, he had some early developmental problems. We won't go into all that. Uh, his compensation payments were insufficient to run a household. He had financial hardship. Problems with the insurance company because everything was being declined, whatever he asked for. He applied for a disability support pension. It was declined because it was workers' comp. Uh, and you know, there was a lot of unnecessary delay in approvals uh, from workers' compensation for specific and timely treatment. And, and so now it has become a very complex presentation after seven years. Now we can break this down. So what are the problems he's had? He's had physical problems that are real, psychological problems, Oh, excessive opioids, and this creates another problem called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. In other words, the opioid medication itself makes the pain problem worse. His cognition was affected. He couldn't think straight. He lacked a lot of coping skills, a lot of misinformation, hoping for a cure despite all the problems. And he, he was confused. He was catastrophizing. Family issues are a problem, lost all his friends, and you know, his wife divorced him. So this became a very complex biopsychosocial chronic pain condition. Now, moving on from here, are there different types of pain? Yes, there are. We've got what is known as acute pain. In other words, you've hurt yourself and that's acute pain. And then there's cancer pain. These tend to have been very self-limiting. But if the acute pain doesn't get resolved, uh, or even the cancer pain doesn't get, re get resolved very quickly within a few months, uh, then they go into another state called a chronic or persistent pain uh, condition. There are two fundamental types of pain. One is called a nociceptive or mechanical pain, which is like soft tissue, bone, ligament, muscle pain. That's called a nociceptive. Or you've got a neuropathic or a nerve pain. But in most cases, it is mixed pain. In other words, they get both types in the one person. Examples of nociceptive pain are like severe osteoarthritis. See, this is of the knee. This is a normal knee. This is an abnormal knee. You can see the cartilage is worn out. It's bone on bone. And the patients can be troubled with severe osteoporotic uh, pain. So this is nociceptive pain. And other forms is when they've had a fracture or they've had burns or they are a, a, a severe sprain of, his uh, of uh, joints. The usual descriptors are throbbing, it's aching, it's stiff. And then you get this neuropathic pain, which is nerve pain. 
which is often described as shooting electric like sensation, burning, tingling sensation. Like this lady who's got uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Uh, this person has got uh, post hepatic neuralgia following shingles. This guy has had post operative chest wall pain due to nerve injury. And of course, he has sciatic nerve problem, you got central stroke pain. So the list goes on. Uh, then we have uh, uh, in the spine, we can have disc problems. That's a disc prolapse, which is pressing on the nerve. These are the outlets for the nerve roots from the spine. So this, this herniated disc can compress on the nerve and, and these patients can develop not only severe back pain due to muscle spasm, as you can see, uh, but they can also have nerve root pain. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as you can see in that picture, uh, and here is a man who had a, a severe trauma to his bilateral limbs. Actually, the right leg is amputated. He's got a he got a prosthesis. Uh, I'm not showing the picture of that, but the left leg you can see is all mangled and the nerves is damaged, and so are the muscles. And this guy has had his amputation following a motorbike accident. So he has got not only nerve and phantom pain, but he's also got a lot of soft tissue pain. So that's mixed pain. There's a continuum of pain. What it, what it means is that initially the acute pain. Acute pain is, 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 is a protective, it's guarding. Uh, in other words, it tells you that something is wrong. And so you treat it appropriately. But if it's not treated appropriately in three to six months, they develop a syndrome called the chronic pain. Now, chronic pain uh, is not a useful pain. It's no longer protective to the individual. In fact, it tends to damage and destroy uh, the individual's uh, problem. So really chronic pain, when they develop this or persistent pain, should be treated as a chronic disease process rather than uh, like an acute pain. So the treatments are entirely different. Uh, <clears throat> Now, just to uh, break it down a little bit further, patient develops pain, and the, depending on the severity of pain or what kind of pain they experience. After a period of time, uh, there is a physical compromise where the, 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 the attitudes change, they develop fear avoidance, they, they reduce their activity levels, and this then gets complicated by the psychological trauma, where there's depression, disempowerment, helplessness, loss of confidence, catastrophizing, you know, all those things happen, you know. So, and, and, and this then gets complicated by the social environment where their financial situations are affected, where they lose their friends, their social circles are all affected. And this then gets uh, ultimately complicated by the individual where their behavior changes. So you see, what starts off as acute pain you then get this layer upon layer of problems that tends to occur as the weeks and months and years progress. So you see, now it becomes a very complicated thing. What are we treating here? Uh, where do we start treatment with this, with this complex group of patients? So there's a biopsychosocial aspect of it. The biological side of it, again, I'm not going to go through a lot of these details. Uh, you can refer to it on the slides. Uh, it'll be on the website. So they might develop a nociceptive or nerve pain, or they develop sensitization or neuroplasticity. The immune system can be affected. The glial cells, which is a kind of a nerve uh, activity that, that can become hyperactive, which is a different kind of a nerve system. And, and of course, there's a genetic order to that. Psychologically, they can be you know, their beliefs, their coping skills, their mood, their personality, attention to pain. In other words, they think about the pain all the time uh, and it just becomes worse. And then they develop what, what is one of the learned behavior from the past. I mean, that can go on. That's, that's a huge area. Uh, and on the social side, of course, the family, social supports, uh, the demands, the financial side, the secondary gains, the cultural backgrounds. Again, all these things come into play. Uh, that's the summary. I've deliberately give, shown this is functional MRI of the brain. This top end here is a patient who developed uh, a, a, had a major trauma, motor vehicle accident, brought into hospital. The guy was conscious and he's screaming his head off. What they did was they gave him intravenous fentanyl, which is an opioid, to try and calm him down. So you can see the brain activity of the functional MRI has significantly reduced. Now, although it is reduced, what it tells us is, despite the strong, potent intravenous medication, he is still feeling the pain. So in other words, no matter how much of medication you give them, 
It doesn't mean you're going to wipe out the pain. No, it'll be there, but you just reduce it and control it. So this is a good example uh, of, of pain and giving them medications uh, to, uh, to, to minimize uh, by, by percentage. And then we have another slide here, again, at functional MRI. I want you to just concentrate on the bottom one, where this person has pain, and, and, and then the attending to his pain, uh, telling him, oh, it must be terrible for you. You must be really suffering. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how you're managing it. So the more they talk about his pain to him, you can see the, uh, in the brain function, the MRI, it seems to light up more. And then they distract him from his pain, talk about you know, what he enjoys, what he likes in life, uh, about his family situation, uh, uh, holidays, or whatever it is. And as they were talking, they were recording, you can see that entire zone where the brain, where it was functioning, it is, it is gone. You know? So in other words, distraction, meditation, and all those other things can help these people uh, with, with uh, in minimizing their pain. Of course, here it is. Uh, I've got a title, Why Do Two People Experience the Same Intensity of Pain Similar So Differently? That's a whole list of things. I'm, I'm not going to go into all of them, but th as I showed you the initial slide, the four different personalities, that sort of fits in here. In other words, different personalities uh, per perceive pain differently and, and, and how they exhibit uh, uh, in terms of their demands and things like that. It tends to vary from one person to another. Now, so chronic pain, uh, really, someone who's troubled with persistent pain, non-cancer pain, should be treated like any other chronic disease like diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and all that. They can't be cured, but all you're trying to do is try to control it. Uh, what happens here is that the nervous system goes into a disarray. In other words, it becomes wonky. Uh, for unknown reasons, commonly due to biological, psychological, sociological, or other consequences. So some examples of uh, significant chronic pain is low back pain, neck pain, headache, pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis in the bladder, diabetic neuropathy, phantom pain. The list is enormous. This is a huge list. Almost any part of the human body can be affected by chronic pain or multiples. There are a lot of myths and, uh, and uh, dis uh, you know, uh, things that which people believe uh, that pain is harmful and potentially is severely disabling. I mean, this is again is a myth. Uh, fear avoidance behavior, the reducer activity. They say, if I do less, my pain will be better. No, actually, it should be the other way around. They should start slowly improving their activities. So fear avoidance is a major issue and problem. Tendency to low mood and withdrawal from social interaction. The more they isolate themselves, the worse the pain problem becomes. They should actually interact with their family. Family should be more sympathetic, empathetic towards them. And friends and social connections should continue. Uh, and the expectation that passive treatment rather than active participation will help, that's wrong. They should have actually have a lot more active participation like walking, cycling, swimming, whatever it is, active, be active, not passive. And generally in the ladder of management, they see the primary GP when they have a problem and if necessary, they refer on to the specialist for specialist treatment. And then if it's a cancer or any other uh, palliative thing, then other rehabilitation oncologists are involved. And if none of them seem to help and if they're in problem, then they end up with the multidisciplinary pain centers like ours. And from there, we tend to give them a lot of pain education program. And in that process, we might do some in, in minimally invasive procedures to reduce your pain so that you know they can participate in exercise plan. In a small subset population of patients at the pinnacle, uh, some of these patients might require neurodestructive procedures uh, or implantable therapies like spinal stimulators or, or, or a pump implants and things like that in the spine. But that's in a very small percentage of patients. Now, there are lots of options to management, uh, of course, pharmacological or medications, simple uh, medications. Some patients might require opioids, although this has been misused over the years and it become a major problem, not only in the United States, but in Australia as well. We try to minimize this as much as possible over the years. Some of them might be on antidepressants because of their mood changes. 
uh, anticonvulsants for nerve pain like pregabalins and gabapentin and you know and all these other different medications uh, some of them may require bone metabolism agents uh, or corticosteroids and then we have the non-pharmacological side which is active physical therapy the occupational therapies with ergonomic design in terms of their home environment, the, the sleeping uh, arrangements and things of that nature, exercise programs, the pain education programs, or they require counseling with the, with the experienced psychologist for CBT, hypnotherapy, meditation, etc. Again, this is a reasonably long list, which I will leave it open uh, for you to look at. Now, overall, one in five Australians suffer from uh, uh, significant chronic pain. Fortunately, majority of them can be managed with simple measures, but in the small subset population, uh, they can't manage it. They require medical and allied health uh, assistance. It's a huge cost to and a burden to the Australian economy. Um, and many patients do turn to complementary medicine because they feel modern medicine is not helping them. Uh, but then again, even here, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, stuff that goes on which uh, is, is, is not properly mandated or controlled. Um, and, and, and obviously, the, uh, a lot of our patients uh, suffering with this trouble are seeking passive methods of treatment. Uh, which is uh, which is not the real uh, goal. I mean, they can have it, but they must uh, have uh, more of an active participation. Uh, associated issues are embellishment of the symptoms, fraud. Uh, it's not my fault. Somebody fixed me. You know, uh, those stuff. Not taking responsibility for their own uh, uh, problems. They must be active participants, and and this is what we teach them in the pain education programs. Now, coming to imaging investigation, x-rays, blood tests, nuclear scans, and MRI, CTEs, and all that, generally, we don't take a lot of consideration to these things. We do do this, but it must correlate with the clinical findings of the individual. Uh, it, that, that's very important. We are treating the patient. We are not treating uh, the, the MRIs or the CT scans, and that's the fundamental difference. I'll show you some uh, MRI finding of a spine. Here is a man who was uh, complaining very bitterly of his back pain, and he, he runs down his buttocks to the back of his knee, and it is a work injury, and did an MRI. It's, it's pristine, it's clean, clear, nothing wrong, you know, and yet he was complaining so bitterly about it. So this guy's problem was mainly muscular uh, skeletal, in other words, muscular problem. It, it, it's not an operative thing. He requires a lot of exercise, hydrotherapy, etc. And then there's an MRI of another patient. Here you can see this patient has got significant canal stenosis, uh, and uh, this is already starting to have stenosis of the spine. But he did not present with any back pain or leg pain. So you see, although there's a positive findings, he didn't have any symptoms. He was sent to us because he had a prostate cancer and the MRI was done to rule out to make sure he doesn't have any secondary deposits in the spine. And there was none, fortunately for him. So this is an incidental finding and yet he doesn't have any symptoms. So you see, uh, it, it, it investigations, although they're useful, it's got to be correlated with the clinical findings. There are some invasive therapies at which uh, we might request uh, to reduce the intensity of pain, whereby now the individual can participate uh, with more exercise, uh, hydrotherapy, and be more uh, cooperative uh, in terms of their psychological counseling and other forms of things. This is to minimize their or reduce the pain. Facet joint uh, treatment in the lumbar spine, these are the facet joints. And in the neck, you can also have facet joints. These are sacroiliac joints uh, in the lumbar spine. They can inject some steroids uh, or they can have uh, 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 epidurals uh, done. Uh, and if uh, they have, and if that shows a positive finding, in other words, they've improved even for a few days or weeks, pain comes back, then we can do what is known as a radiofrequency ablation treatment, again, through uh, a needle procedure with the use of fluoroscopy guidance. Uh, and this seems to provide them with reduced pain for several months to, to years, provided they, they participate in, in physical uh, conditioning program once this is done. Uh, this is the epidural that's done for some patients when you've got nerve root pain. 
uh, prior to surgery. Sometimes they don't need surgery once this is done, provided the patients have a very positive outlook in life. But if it's going, uh, this problem is going on for too long, then generally epidurals don't seem to work. Uh, so it's a waste of time. Uh, and some patients might develop from a condition called CRPS, a complex regional pain syndrome. You might have to do stellate ganglion blocks. And these are some of the patients, like this guy had, had an injury to his hand. Uh, he was a glazier and so he had swollen arms. And likewise, this patient has had a laceration to the hand and the whole arm is uh, red and swollen. Sometimes it turns purple. And this is a more advanced CRP as well. The whole hand is clawed and it's useless compared to the other hand. And, and, uh, and, and, and they can suffer terribly uh, with this complex regional pain syndrome. Fortunately, it's not a very common condition. Um, but early, when you get them early, we can do something to reverse it. But once it's too late, then it's, 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 it's a permanent problem. Same thing can happen in the lower limbs. This guy was a basketball player. Uh, he slipped, he fell, he hurt himself, and that's what's happened. In the end, he had, uh, he had to have a lumbar sympathetic blocks and other things, uh, and uh, nothing seemed to have helped. They thought initially it was an infection. No, there was no infection here at all. Uh, he had gone through a whole host of tests, uh, and in the end, he, unfortunately, he ended up with an amputation uh, uh, below the knee uh, because uh, he couldn't tolerate the problem. And here's another case. Uh, and here's another of the nurses uh, in the hospital who slipped and fell uh, whilst delivering medications and ended up with the CRPS. Again, we do lumbar sympathetic blocks. And in fact, this lady ended up with a spinal cord stimulator to control a severe nerve pain to the leg. Uh, and uh, uh, we tend to, uh, in a more advanced thing, in a small, small subset population of patients, we might have to do a spinal cord stimulator implant if they have uh, primarily leg pain or nerve pain. And this is what the stimulator looks like. Uh, under imaging, uh, we put in the leads to the spine. This is the AP or anterior posterior view of the spine. And this is a lateral view to show where it is sitting and is well away from the spinal cord which runs right down the uh, center here. And here it shows the different types of leads that one could put in. Uh, in summary, of course, uh, why do they develop? Uh, once they develop chronic pain, uh, all these things happen, the reduced activity, uh, uh, helpful beliefs and thoughts, uh, repeated treatment failure, uh, loss of job, financial difficulty, long-term use of analgesics and opioids and sedatives, which create side effects. And emotionally, they tend to develop this depression, helplessness, et cetera, with that, and then it becomes excessive pain that they suffer. So in other words, this whole experience of chronic pain, once they get into that scenario, there's a whole amplification that can take place. Now, to treat these patients, you've got to understand all these things and tease it out one at a time with the, with the cooperation of the family. Now... Many of patients uh, in the recent past, and it's continuing on till today, there's still a lot of opioid medications, oxycontins and amiscontin and huge amounts of uh, dependatol and whatever else that's out there. Uh, the more of it they take, they tend to develop a condition called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. In other words, the opioids themselves drive the pain and make the pain worse. They become much more sensitive to the pain. So the treatment, obviously, is to get them off these things, uh, detox these patients over, over weeks or over months. Uh, some of these patients who develop chronic headaches, you know, they're on these opioids, they tend to develop rebound analgesic headache. In other words, they get these headaches and they take more medication. And when the time runs out, six hours, eight hours later, the pain becomes worse, headache becomes worse, they take some more, and, it, and, and the cycle goes on. So they've got to break that cycle somewhere along the line. And then they have what is known as a glial cell activity. These are glial cells are uh, what is we used to think of them as, as feeders. In other words, they take the waste products of uh, the normal nerves and they bring in the nutrition for the nerve, for the nerve's uh, uh, survival. But in a chronic situation, these glial cells, that's oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and there are a few others, you know, um, they take a life of their own. And that itself, these nerves also can 
perpetuate and create and make the uh, chronic pain condition worse. So I'm just going to summarize all these things now. So the approach and therapy to management is in a pie chart, the narrative, the assessment, the diagnosis and explaining the condition to the patient by the doctor or the pain physician or whoever is going to look after this patient is extremely important. Most people are confused what's wrong with me. So if someone explains some things to them, that goes a long way uh, to, to settle their mind. Okay, medications might play some role, whatever the medications are. And if they're taking excessive medications, they got to go through drug and alcohol or detoxification. And that's a certain percentage of patients have to go through that. See, the most important as aspect of the therapy is this. Physical therapy, psychological therapy, counseling. These are very important and CBT and whatever else. Hydrotherapy, daily exercise routine, attending a gym, exercise physiology, uh, whatever there is, that's important. Uh, they might get more pain when they do it, but that's what I would call as a, uh, there are two, uh, I call that a good pain. The patient suffering from a bad pain and when they exercise, the pain gets worse. We generally tell them that's good pain because you're using some of the muscles that you've never used for a long time, and that's hurting, that's good pain. So you pace yourself, keep going. And of course, the pain education and group therapy becomes very important. This is where they, 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 they learn to cope. You know, These are coping strategies in, in a group situation. So you can see almost 50% of the therapy is non-invasive, non-medication. You know, uh, that's what we want. In a very small subset of, po of this population, you might need some invasive intervention, like I mentioned, the like facet joint and epidural steroids, or they may need radio frequency cauterization, or they might need uh, implantable therapies like spinal cord stimulator, et cetera. So this is a whole uh, pie chart as, as a summary of, of, of the therapy that these patients require. Now, as far as the workers' compensation and third-party patients are concerned, what happens is whatever treatment that is tr required of them must be done consecutively. In other words, uh, you don't go, don't go for uh, physiotherapy and forget about the psychological therapy. Six months later, we'll do the psychological therapy or one year, we'll do the education therapy uh, or, or five years later, we'll do your detoxification. It's fractured all over the place. It's not going to help these people. Most of this must be done simultaneously as far as possible. At least this part of it uh, must be done simultaneously to gain maximal outcome and output. Now, what happened to our, our, our patient, Michael? Well, uh, seven years he traveled with it. He came to see us. It took us nearly two years to do something for him because we are having trouble with the insurance company to get approvals. Uh, and it took a couple of years to stabilize it. He had to undergo a complete detoxification of all his medications. That's the opioids and benzodiazepine. We continued intensive psychological therapy on a fortnightly basis for two years. Physical therapy, which included unsupervised exercise and hydrotherapy. The social worker, uh, the occupational therapy was involved in the home situation to try and you know, improve his daily activity function. He had to attend our pain education program. And later he actually became one of uh, uh, active participants for the other chronic pain patients who came into the group. In other words, uh, he was became like a supervisor to them, to the new patients. We had to, I had to do a spinal cord stimulator implant because he had a severe leg pain and it reduced his overall pain by about 50%. That's about the ballpark, 50, 60% uh, in properly chosen cases. It's never going to be 100%. He was off all his uh, regular opioids and benzodiazepine, which is a very good thing. He was never able to return to any paid employment because he never had the qualifications for it, but he was doing voluntary work in the joint of men's shed. Uh, and he was getting his uh, uh, fortnightly allowance from, from workers' compensation insurer. So it was a good outcome. Uh, he no longer required any more any further surgery or any further medical intervention because he knew what the problem was and he was able to manage it in a positive frame of mind. So I'm going to end this year. I know it's quite exhaustive. Uh, and thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions if there are. Thank you. 
That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, <clears throat> and and um, very beautifully presented as usual. Um, I have a question for somebody who was not able to attend. Yes. And they, their question is, what tools or tests do you do to determine whether the presentation of pain is genuine or whether the person is bunging it on? Yes, that's a, that's a very good and very interesting but a very a difficult question to answer. Uh, there are lots of tools at which we can use, say, for patients who require you want to check the uh, for functionality you do the osvestry test uh, or you do the uh, uh, you know as i said there are, there are numerous different tests that's available there, there are mountains of them now uh, uh, smps and things like that pain descriptors you know invariably these patients when you give them this questionnaire in my clinical experience very early in the piece when i was starting out uh, i used to very uh, diligently follow through all these questionnaires but later i took less and less notice of it the most important thing is the, your your clinical uh, confrontation with the patient sit the, sit them down talk to them ask them what their problems are and go through the whole process and uh, in that uh, process, of, and, and as you gain more and more experience, you will begin to pick up uh, where someone is very genuine in their complaint and someone who is really out for some uh, financial gains or secondary gains, or someone is angry with the doctor because he hadn't done the right thing or hasn't explained something to them the way they wanted it. Uh, and once you've gone through that process uh, or, or, or several sessions and sittings, uh, then you can bring in the questionnaires and then you'll get a more realistic uh, answer. Mm -hmm. When you bring in the questionnaire very early in the piece, I invariably find zero is no problems, 10 is excellent, exception, uh, it, it, it's terrible, they're feeling awful. Invariably, all of them will go to the 8, 9, 10 out of 10 uh, uh, scores, you know, and, and that's that really is what is unhelpful. Mm -hmm. I know that the, the allied health and psychologists, psychiatrists may not agree with me, but uh, nonetheless, in my clinical experience, uh, I do use this, those tools, those questionnaires. Uh, as I said, if you just... Uh, go on the website, you'll get a whole host of those questionnaires and uh, better mm -hmm. if I could nominate any specific ones, okay. uh, but use it down the track, not very early in the piece. Talk to the right. patient. That's the most important. And Good what are the activity levels and what their expectations are. All right. Now we have another question. Do you have any advice for case managers, insurers as to what they can do to suggest in situations where they have the suspicion that a worker is struggling with persistent pain and they and the GP are chasing a solely biological or biomechanical explanation of the pain and heading towards possibly unnecessary surgery or Absolutely. subsequent surgery. Absolutely. Again, fantastic. I'm glad somebody asked that question because you find that <clears throat> uh, in a chronic situation, like I showed you with all those slides, please refer back to those slides if you can get your hands on it. Uh, what it tells you is that in the majority of patients, they will have physical deconditioning. So uh, someone has got terrible back problem. And they, they, they try and get out of bed in the morning. They're finding a huge amount of uh, you know, uh, difficulty uh, get, getting out of bed, that stiffness, that pain. And what that tells you is that these are the people who've got a lot of mechanical pain or muscle wasting problem. Um, or on the other side, you might get uh, someone who is sort of you know, complaining of arm pain, uh, or, or the neck pain, uh, same similar situation. You often it is due to uh, muscle wasting and physical deconditioning. On top of that, what happens is that, from a psychological point of view, they tend to become completely deconditioned. They're very angry people. They're lacking sleep. Uh, get, put yourself in their situation where you haven't had a proper sleep. Uh, even for one week, you'll be a cranky person. Can you imagine someone who's not had had not had a proper sleep, say, for one to two years, you know, they, they, they are not them, themselves anymore. And what do these people are expecting? They're expecting some quick fix. Somebody help me. 
give me the pills, give me this, give me that, give me a, a tense machine, give me some whatever, you know, massage therapy, uh, acupuncture and things like that. Sure, this, in some patients it might help to a point, but it's not going to be a cure. So uh, at the end of the day, the, although the GP or the case managers might say, now look, how do we know this is genuine? Again, I think you've got to, if you're concerned, refer it on to a, a, a good specialist, good assessing doctor who's got some amount of empathy for these patients and then work it from first principle, have a working plan <clears throat> and, and, and the condition explained to the patient so that they are not in a state of confusion. They, are, they now understand, okay, now I know what my problem is. Uh, I will take that advice on board. It may, the one-off may not be good enough. You might have to see them second time, third time. And you send the plan of management back to the GP um, and the physiotherapists and the psychologists who are always looking after them. So everybody's on the same page, trying to give the same message to the patient. Do, they, do many of these patients with severe ongoing chronic pain require surgery? Maybe a very small subset may require it. The majority, they don't, because they can be managed conservatively. But as I said, all these approvals have got to come in in a timely fashion. Uh, in other words, uh, if there's a plan put out, make sure that uh, everything is done uh, and, and, and not just uh, one facet of allied health for six months and that, oh, that didn't work, the physiotherapy, or let's go for psychological counseling for another three months, or that didn't work, let's go for another two months of hydrotherapy. That, you know, this bits and pieces is an absolute waste of time and money. And you just frustrate the person. So yes. go for the plan, get everything done in, in, within within a three month period or whatever, maximize it certainly and, seems to resonate with with what um, other specialists tell us, e even even orthopedic surgeons, are, yes. you know, saying that off, very often you need to go through an intensive and focused period of that before you consider surgery. Yes. Now, I have another question here, sir. It's, if, 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 if I might just step a little bit, you know, if sorry, you, yes. I, I don't want to step into any other specialties. Uh, uh, no, no, of course, anything, of course. But let's just take an example of some person who requires a knee replacement surgery. Uh, just by doing a mechanically go and remove the knee and put another uh, prosthetic knee and tell the patient, okay, everything is fixed, go away. You know what? 20 to 30 percent of those patients, they don't do well. Maybe even a bigger percentage, they don't do well. Why? Because they haven't been prepared. They have to undergo their intensive physical therapy rehabilitation before surgery to maximize the muscle and ligament strength. Surgery is done and, and then postoperatively intensive another two months or three months of whatever that exercise is, whatever the protocols are, they have to follow it. Then the success rate would be perhaps 85 to 90 percent out of 100 percent. Absolutely. Sure, the 10 percent might not do well, but purely as a mechanical thing, a bigger percentage are not going to do well. They'll be very upset and angry. They are the ones who end up with us, which is what we want to avoid. Mm. Sorry. Go Absolutely. On. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so we've got one last question here, and that is, how would one be able to differentiate between what you spoke about, good pain and bad pain, during this active therapy? Yes, yes. Bad pain is what the person has. In other words, they're complaining all the time. You know, I can't walk. I can't stand. I can't lie down. I can't get out of bed. I can't get out of a chair. That's the bad pain. And then they say, when I do my hydrotherapy, I really feel better, you know, while I'm in the pool. But the minute I get out of the pool, I try to stand my, my pain actually has got worse. That's because they have start, they were using some of the muscles in the back or the legs or wherever, which they have not used for a long time. Assuming this, suppose you've had a fracture of your forearm and you put a plaster cast on you. And the plaster cast is on for, say, six weeks. At the end of six weeks, the plaster cast is removed. Have a look at both your arms. You will find that you've lost about 20 to 30% of your muscle bulk because it, your arm wasn't moving for six weeks. So quickly, it, it, it gets destroyed. Can you imagine someone having this kind of a back pain problem where the muscles are wasted for one and two and three years? This is much more significant. Now, you've got to slowly build it up. 
So each time they try to do it, that pain is a little bit worse. So that's the good pain. But don't let them do too much at the, at the same time, just a little bit at a time, just, you know, um, five minutes a, a day for about a one or two weeks and go to seven minutes uh, for the next fortnight and then go to nine or 10 minutes, you know, for, for, for the next uh, uh, second or third month onwards and slowly build it up on a daily basis. Uh, you find that uh, they tend to do much, much better, provided they understand, provided it's explained to them why there is muscle wasting. Um, and, and that concept must, must be in their head. If they don't accept it, if that concept is not there, it's not going to work. Right. So talking to them all the time is important. Now, I've got one last question, and I'm letting this one through because it's actually a very good question. Um, there seems to be a reluctance to suggest that workers are referred to a pain physician, seemingly due to an assumption that the worker will be stuck in a cycle of treatment, and also an attitude that the cost of pain programs is very high, considering the outcomes we see. Is there anything that you can suggest to work on changing this attitude? Yes, that that's again, you know, it's it's uh, uh, it, it sort of comes back to my, uh, my 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 peers. I understand that uh, the you know I've had patients um, who have been seeing a psychologist on a weekly or a fortnightly basis for five years and six years. And in some cases I've come across up to even 10 years and continuing. To me, that's absolute nonsense. That should not happen, okay? Because they should have certain limits. Um, start off with 10 sessions, maybe another 10 sessions. And then after that, uh, you know, uh, phys physiotherapy is the same thing. Uh, have it for a three months and reassess them. Uh, and if there is no improvement, forget about it and tell them you do the exercises yourself, you know, uh, and not to continue uh, on this merry-go-round of giving them more and more and more uh, funding uh, to do something where there is no uh, uh, improvement. This is where the question has come in. This is where a patient assessment uh, by the therapist becomes important. Often you find that the patients want passive treatment. So, you know, you, you've got to minimize those, those, those things. And once everything is down and patient now understands more or less uh, why they've got this problem, then I think they've got to put them into the pain programs, even before uh, all these more advanced uh, implantable therapies uh, come into play. In fact, that should come in much later. Uh, so the pain, what is the idea of pain education, pain program, which might run for two weeks or whatever it is? I know it's expensive, but I tell you what, that four or $5,000 or uh, 7,000, depending on which center it is, uh, it's, it's money worth spent because in, uh, in, in a majority of patients, they really don't require a lot of treatment after that. But if you don't put that amount of effort into them in the beginning, then it'll be piecemeal forever for years and cumulatively it becomes an enormous cost. Even after the pain progress, some of them may require the more advanced implantable therapy. That's fine. But the patient understands why that's being done rather than, uh, well, we're going to do it because we feel you're going to improve. Uh, and I think this is where uh, assessments, these patients, if there are, even my own field, my own colleagues, I've trained a lot of doctors around the country and internationally. I, this is always my message. Do the best you know for your patient and, uh, and, and, and don't do unnecessary things. Uh, and, 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 and so doing this pain program stuff is important. And, and if, you're, if your workers' compensation claims managers are confused, my suggestion is send them to someone who knows the field, who can now assess the patient, who can now give a plan of management in the one or two sittings and, and, and organize it and follow that plan. Don't deviate too far out of that. But if it's just individual pain physicians looking at this uh, as, as a single practitioner, uh, I, I, I tell you what, sometimes I begin to wonder whom are they working for, for the patient, for themselves, um, for the uh, <laughs> for the bank, for what you know? I know I'm being very cynical about it, but that is the reality of life. So yeah. I urge you to send if you're confused about particular patient's treatment, send it for proper assessment and a plan of management. Once you've got that in writing, 
then it becomes easy for everybody. Wonderful. I hope I've answered that uh, to, to some Look, extent. That has been terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Sundaraj. We need to wrap up now. Um, but I think I, I speak for everyone here when I say this has been a really terrific talk, very informative and very helpful. Thank you, everybody, also for making the time to join us. And as I said, the recording and the slides will come out to you within about a day. Thank you again, Doctor, for providing your time and your advice and your, your information to us. We thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.